December 1st, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today for this webinar. We appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here with us. It is time to begin the webinar. My name is Ryan Pearson with Electronic Data Solutions. I'm the Vector Control Software Sales Coordinator for Electronic Data Solutions. Joining me this day is Chase Fly, um, our colleague who uh, manages our UAS program. Today's webinar will discuss how unmanned aircraft uh, systems may be used for mosquito control operations. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time. Because of the size of the group online, we have placed everyone in mute uh, mode to avoid background noise and interference that may distract us during today's presentation. However, we do wish to answer any questions that you may have. Please, in the GoToWebinar tools, uh, just type in any questions that arise during today's broadcast. Um, we'll be happy to answer those questions at the end of today's presentation. Uh, otherwise, we'll be contacting each of you who attend the uh, webinar today, and we can uh, discuss your questions during that follow-up conversation if you desire. Uh, with that, let me introduce today's presentation. Um, I will be giving a, a brief introduction using some PowerPoint slides to uh, unmanned aircraft systems um, and how they may be applied for mosquito control operations. After this brief introduction, I will turn control over to Chase Fly, who will further introduce our unmanned aircraft system technology and demonstrate how it could be used for mosquito control operations. With that introduction, let's go ahead and begin today's um, broadcast. Um, UAS is a, is a buzz term. It stands for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Um, this is a uh, basically a remotely operated aircraft, whether it be fixed wing or rotor um, multi-rotor um, type aircraft. These are remotely operated autonomous systems um, that carry a payload of sensors. Most typically, this is digital imaging sensors. It could be other sensors as well. The advantage of this system is that you have the ability to view large areas in high resolution. You'll see examples of that today during the broadcast. And another tremendous advantage that I see from mosquito control is that you have the ability to access remote areas, areas that are far away from, from uh, motorized vehicle um, access or um, large tracts of perhaps private land that need to be analyzed for um, mosquito breeding sources. Um, unmanned aircraft systems, the, you'll hear this term during today's um, broadcast, but the deliverables, uh, the product deliverables are images that can be processed and classified. Um, the output or those uh, deliverables are compatible with our Sentinel GIS and our Field Secret GIS software applications. So they do integrate with our mosquito control software solutions. So I want to just talk about how I envision um, UAS being used in mosquito control. The primary purpose will be to find mosquito breeding habitat. Um, UAS may be used to inspect areas visually that are remote or, or difficult to access for one reason or another. Using other sensors, we can also look at vegetation type. Um, a predictor of standing water could be vegetation species or type. Um, so this could be a, a valuable tool for determining standing water or wet areas. Another application using infrared would be plant vigor, just looking at plants that are um, very vigorous that indicate that there's a plentiful supply of water. And lastly, uh, Chase will talk about this too, as just three-dimensional modeling, looking for low spots compared to the surrounding area that can predict a, um, a place where water can build up. These are the aspects we'll be talking about primarily today, which will be mapping and um, um, three-dimensional modeling. In the future, there's a some additional capabilities kind of exciting. One would be a project called Project Premonition, um, being uh, led by Microsoft, which is an adult surveillance program, uh, integrating uh, adult surveillance techniques, genome sequencing, um, and wireless communication from the field. 
and then another possible future capability would be pesticide delivery to these difficult to reach areas. With that brief introduction, I want to turn the time over to Chase Fly, who will uh, further introduce UAS and, and demonstrate our, our capabilities here. Great, thanks, uh, Ryan. Okay. So I'm going to just talk a bit about the technology and then give you a demonstration of what a workflow might look like. Um, but to, before I get into that workflow, I want to just make sure we're all kind of understanding what uh, technology or methods we're using. So UAS can be used in a number of ways, um, you know, video recording, film, um, taking still photographs, uh, live video feeds for inspection type applications, and all those might have a place in mosquito control. But the, our expertise is in geospatial field data collection, and and uh, photogrammetry and aerial survey is 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 sort of the the overall method that we're using with you unmanned aircraft systems. So, um, and that's not new new technology. Um, photogrammetry has been a uh, science that's been around for decades, um, typically used with uh, from images collected from manned aircraft or satellites, stitching those images together to create a composite image of an area. And so that's what we're doing with UAS. The, the standard data outputs, the deliverables that you get out of this, uh, these systems are typically georeferenced ortho mosaic aerial images, digital surface models, which are elevation models of an area. Um, and then point clouds, so very high density uh, point clouds, which each individual point uh, contains an X, Y, Z value, latitude, longitude, elevation. So not only do you know, uh, can you model from that, but you, you know what the coordinates and distances are relative from one spot to another within that image or data set. So to just show you a few examples before we uh, get into the software, this uh, an aerial image that was collected with a near infrared sensor from a UAS. So you can see just from the raw imagery, or this has also obviously been false colorized here for visual representation, but from pretty basic imagery, you can see wet spots and you can see drier spots. And, and this in itself will, this sort of data in itself will be a benefit for mosquito control applications where you can identify areas of wetness, uh, perhaps low lying areas and areas you might need to go out and take a closer look at on the ground for, for treatment or, or to inspect for habitat or breeding sources. This would be a full color orthomosaic. So this again is several individual images that were stitched together to create one composite image. And we're looking at just an industrial site here. You can see different, uh, you can probably guess there's some relief in that image, but you can't totally tell just by looking at a a colorized image. So from there we can create a digital surface model and that's what we're looking at here. We've got it classified by elevation, high and low. Um, so when you get to those digital surface models from imagery, it is important to note that these are true surface models. So you can see on the left, uh, lower left of that image that though you're looking, you're seeing some sagebrush or you're seeing vegetation, tops of vegetation. You can see where the road runs through, which is a true bare earth. Down in the low greener area, you can see buildings, and you're actually looking at the surfaces of the tops of those buildings or structures, as opposed to a bare earth surface. From this sort of data, you can use different software programs and algorithms to extrapolate what a true terrain model might look like. Um, but we're usually looking at a, a surface model like this. But that is probably more realistically useful for a mosquito control application because as you know, even those uh, breeding sources can be found on anything from pile to tires to uh, industrial sites, and so it's important to kind of capture that whole and identify high and low. Uh, from those data sets, you can create derived uh, uh, data products like this 3D model of an open pit mine. So very powerful tool, um, all taken from a camera that was on board an aircraft and ultimately, we end up with a georeferenced 3D model that can be used for a number of applications. Here we're looking at a point cloud, uh, high density point clouds. So you can see what's happening there. You can see the terrain. You can see the colors. Um, you could click on two points within that map. 
and measure the distances. You can see the swimming pool. You could even measure the area of a swimming pool within that image, and that might help you even know what type of material you need to have with you when you go out to the field for closer inspection or treatments. All right, let's get out of that, and I'm going to jump over to some uh, software and look at the, the workflow here. So what we're seeing here is a um, uh, uh, the Trimble Access Aerial Imaging software, which is Trimble's mission planning software for their UAS systems. And th it's pretty straightforward. There are lots of other programs that do this for different platforms. Most proprietary vehicles will have their own mission planning software. If they're an autonomous system, there's some open source stuff out there too. And they all kind of get at the same principle. So I'm just going to show you Trimble's today for an example. And what we're looking at is uh, I've created or I've downloaded a, a Google, you know, satellite imagery just for a reference map within my uh, um, for my project area. This is a golf course not far from our home office here in Jerome, Idaho, and yeah, it's down near the river. Um, there's some ponds, and this is the Blue Lakes area. So there's these uh, ponds and lakes uh, for coming from natural springs, and there's a lot of potentially wet areas. So maybe this would be a site that we'd want to inspect for mosquito control. Um, so what I've done is I've I've created some layers. I've created a mission area, and that's here in blue. I've also created an avoidance zone, which that I, I create these areas just by clicking on, uh, say I want to expand the mission area. I can go and, and click around here on the map and create another polygon of an area that I might want to add to my mission. Same with the avoidance zone. So very simple interface, um, but what, what I do with this mission area is I can look over here and see where I've selected the camera I'm going to use. I'm going to use a Sony A5100 camera with a 15 millimeter lens. And then I set the, the flight height, um, how what the altitude is going to be of that uh, flight that I'm going to conduct. 329 feet, it's below the 400 feet maximum ceiling that we're allowed to operate within. And that's going to give me a ground sampling distance of about one inch. Um, so that what that means is the imagery, the resolution of the imagery is every pixel in that image that comes out at the end is going to be about one inch square, one inch by one inch, if you were to look at that pixel. So that's a very high resolution image compared to a um, satellite imagery that is usually around a foot. Uh, in best case, you know, a lot of the Google Earth imagery might be as good as a foot. Some of it's only one meter, some of it's 30 meter um, resolution. So very coarse compared to one inch. Uh, from a manned aircraft, um, you'll pay a pretty penny to get about six inch resolution imagery. And uh, so we can do very uh, precise work. We also set our overlap values. Once I've defined a mission area, I'm going to go and create a block. A block is an area that can be completed in a single flight. And so here, this is a small enough area that I can do it in one flight with the Trimble UX5. I could create a big mission area and, and do multiple blocks, multiple flights, break it up as I want. I can to do a couple of smaller blocks in a single flight if I want. But uh, this is where I kind of set up this information. I'm also going to, this is all going to be confirmed in the field. I'm doing this in the office to prepare, but this will all be confirmed in the field. And I'm going to change my wind direction, and if I do that, you'll notice it changes my flight lines as well. In my block, I'm going to confirm the, the attributes of that information, and then I'm going to move to uh, my, my flight. So to create a flight, I first select a block, which here I've already done that, so you can kind of see. I also enter a takeoff and landing area, and I'm going to confirm that in the field with GPS as well, and I can, I can change the takeoff angle or the approach angle to make sure not only that I'm taking off and landing into the wind if I'm using a fixed wing, but that I'm taking off and landing into clear areas. I'm avoiding trees, and here I've got a nice uh, uh, green fairway to land on, so that's that's convenient. Um, but I, I essentially set up the parameters of my flight. Once I've uh, set up my flight and I'm happy with how that looks and the flight lines and where they're going, I can proceed to um, uh, uh, I can proceed to do a simulate, sim, simulation of what that flight's going to look like. And uh, this will give me an idea, okay, it's going to take off and it's going to enter its flight lines. Make sure everything's clear. I'll do this in the field before I actually conduct a flight. Make sure I'm safe to operate. Not going to run into any canyon walls or anything like that. I'll go ahead and cancel that. Um, lastly, we'll go through a checklist. This is the final step before I actually conduct a flight. 
I make sure my parameters are all good. I'm using the right camera. I've got my GSD and my altitude set how I want it. It's going to be about 500 photos to conduct that mission. And then I can go through this checklist. And this is a nice thing about the Trimble program here is it just walks you through an automated checklist. Make sure your battery's connected. Make sure your camera's ready to go. Um, make sure all flight controls and everything our systems are go. Once you've gone through this whole checklist, which is several steps long, it'll tell you you're, you're good to go and you'll arm the system and, uh, and you'll be uh, ready to set the launcher off and be on your way. Once I've completed that flight, I'm going to download all the flight data. I'm going to download the photos and download the flight log from the aircraft, and I'm going to load it into a, a data processing software system. In this case, I've got Trimble Business Center Aerial Photogrammetry up. There are several others. Trimble has another one called UAS Master we like. Um, there are several third-party programs out there from desktop applications to cloud-based software processing. And, and if you're using it in a mapping situation, they all kind of have the same goal, which is to create an orthomosaic image. When I first load this data in here, you can, if we zoom in here, you can kind of see what's going on. Each of these little uh, pictures of the drone here are, are giving me a, a point at which a photo was taken. And then you can see the thumbnail of that individual photograph. And then these, the, also the direction and orientation of where that aircraft was when it took it. You can see my flight lines. This white line here is my, my defined boundary for the final image. And the outer line in the gray area is uh, my mission area. So that's anywhere that aircraft was, is going to be or was at during the flight. These orange rays here, in this case we use ground control points. Sometimes if we want uh, the, the imagery to be not only accurate within itself, relative to itself, but accurate to the geographic uh, area in which it's located, so ground truth type of thing, we'll do ground control points and, and then we'll tie some of those images into those points um, and that allows us to get a more uh, accurate image. So not only is the resolution about one inch, but we know it the accuracy of the lat long and elevation positions are accurate to within six inches or so, whatever the spec might be that we accomplished here. Um, but you kind of see what's going on there. If you look at this in 3D view, you can see all of our uh, flight lines and you'll notice that they aren't all perfectly level. Um, and that is uh, by design. The aircraft is designed to be able to uh, move up and down as it needs to. Um, based on the weather conditions and wind, and, and uh, but that's okay because we know the orientation and position of the aircraft when that picture was taken, and we can uh, uh, accommodate for that in the software. But the, the neat little view there, once we've um, loaded the mission in, as we have, it, it, depending on the software you're using, it's a fairly automated pro process to create the deliverable or to the derived product. The first thing I do is I adjust photo stations. That takes, there's an, a relative adjustment and an absolute adjustment. The relative adjustment is just that, it's a single button click, it's an automated process that, um, uh, that is the reason why you're paying the big, big bucks for it. It uh, uses algorithms to move those photos based on common tie points, which are essentially similar features in different photographs. This, the computer finds those those similar points and then adjust the position and orientation of each photograph to make a nice composite image. If we want to use ground control points, we'll do this absolute adjustment and uh, this will allow us, uh, we will have also put targets on the ground as you can see in this image. We put a physical target on the ground where we surveyed that point in. That allows us to pull that ground control point up in the software and tie the, the image to it. We'll do that with half a dozen or so photos for each ground control point, and then we'll uh, move on. Once our adjustments are done, then, then the hard work's done, and we can look at our, our deliverables. So here we're looking at um, the image. This is from a landfill that we did, uh, flew, and you, if you look at the actual composite image, it's pretty impressive. You can see the resolution is very fine. We can look down even to the individual tires there and the equipment sitting on the dashboard of the pickup. Um, you can see a lot of detail in, in, 
everything in this image, including the, the vegetation. If we look over here, you see uh, some pretty high-res vegetation. So this is the fun part. Now we have an image that we have uh, exported, and, and that's all done with automated tools as well. Um, you know, we can export that image, the surface model, um, which is what we see here. Um, and that's a nice uh, rendition of what uh, the elevation looks like. And as I mentioned, you, it is a true surface model, so we're even uh, modeling what the, the elevations are of these vehicles that were seen in the imagery. Um, and from that, you can create derived products like a contour map, or uh, you can also export the point cloud file. I want to show you um, what the, another project would look like that might use uh, near infrared. Oh, there's our there's our contour map that just popped up. So, very high resolution, one or two foot contours on this particular project. But let me show you a sample data product in in ArcGIS. So this is a, a near infrared photo. This was taken with a camera that takes near infrared green and blue bands. So this is the raw imagery, and just from the raw, the the standard. Uh, image that comes out of this. You can see in red where the wetter areas are and um, over here in blue some of the lighter areas not so wet. There's, this is based on reflectance um, in that near infrared band and so that alone can be of value to mosquito control as you can identify pretty quickly where some wet areas might be versus dry areas and if you get a, an actual water body in here it's going to show up pretty vividly and you'll know um, that's an area that needs looked at, um, as you can kind of see. Uh, not so much there, but you can also then, from a near infrared, do an NDVI calculation, which is good for vegetation assessments and might have some utility for you in mosquito control as well. So to wrap that up, um, uh, just wanted to mention a few things about operating UAS. Um, oops, let me get back and start that from here. So so why uh, why do we care about UAS? Why is it um, uh, useful to us in these applications? And a lot of it has to do with the cost. It can be much cheaper than operating manned aircraft or satellite imagery. There's a lot of new applications that we may not have even considered before. Um, the advancements in technology have made sensors smaller and, and cheaper and, and allows for quick deployment high resolution imagery, it's not so weather dependent, you're flying under the clouds, so you don't have to wait for that aircraft to be able to, to fly at higher altitudes. Um, simplified workflows and the data is GIS ready, so it's ready to analyze in ways you already do. I will mention some challenges for UAS, can be very large scale projects when we're talking tens of square miles even, can become cumbersome or time consuming for UAS. Urban areas may be a problem, not for the technology per se, but for the FAA to allow you to do it. Um, operating near airports or over crowds is, is, not, is usually not allowed and at the very least frowned upon by the FAA. Um, if you've got big sensors or specialized stuff you want to do or anything beyond visual line of sight, you've got to be able to see that aircraft at all times per the FAA's requirements. And there may be privacy concerns to, to consider as well in some of your to control applications and, and operating over private property or things like that. And that can all be dealt with locally, um, but it, it's important to know the regulations. And uh, um, I'll just conclude with this, that uh, there are different categories of UAS operations, public, civil, or model aircraft. Anybody on this call is not going to be able to operate under model aircraft rules. Um, but if you're a public entity, you'll need a certificate of authorization or waiver from the FAA. And if you're a private entity, Usually a Section 333 exemption is the route to go, and that's what that's what our our company operates under um, uh, for both services and and demonstrations of equipment and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, powerful systems out there, and um, a lot of utility in the mosquito control uh, arena. And with that, I'll uh, switch the screen back to Ryan to to conclude. Uh, thanks, Chase, for that demonstration. I appreciate it. Um, I just have a couple slides that I want to uh, share to conclude today's uh, webinar. As I as I mentioned, um, please, if you have questions, go ahead and ask those questions in that dialogue. 
um, in the GoToWebinar dialog. We want to answer those at the end of today's um, at the end of today's demonstration and uh, presentation. Excuse me. But I do have a couple summary slides that I want to share. Um, as, as Chief mentioned, that there's a lot of powerful imaging tools um, that are available using UAS technology, from from true color to near infrared to uh, manipulating and analyzing those photos to extract specific uh, um, vegetation types to look at wetness. Um, lots of tools that can be used to derive where water is likely to be found. Um, those tools can be used very effectively to determine mosquito breeding habitat or likely locations for mosquito breeding habitat. Uh, we showed a lot of functionality today. There's a lot of power there. Um, don't focus on um, all those different deliverables, but how this may actually be a benefit to your program. Chase did a great job of talking about cost. Um, there's lots of different ways to obtain this type of information, but UAS is certainly very inexpensive compared to those other aerial options with much better resolution um, products that you'd be working with. And lastly, uh, all these products that you saw demonstrated, or excuse me, all the products that you saw during today's demonstration um, integrate directly with our field secret GIS and Sentinel GIS software designed specifically for managing mosquito control operations. This is another set of tools. UAS is another set of tools that will help you uh, better understand uh, mosquito breeding, likely mosquito breeding habitat locations. Um, what Elect Data offers. Um, Chase is our uh, UAS program manager. We do offer full UAS services. We can be contracted uh, to um, plan these flight missions to collect the data, the images, to process that data and provide you deliverables um, that meet your criteria. We also are a reseller for certain products. Um, so we do offer UAS sales and support if you're looking at a, getting that uh, um, exemption from the FAA. Um, we can help you with not only providing the UAS equipment but supporting it after the sale. And lastly, we offer a full suite of GIS services and consulting. Um, many of you might be new to GIS and the capabilities that are found there. Um, we do offer resources for uh, data conversion, for uh, geodatabase creation, for integrating uh, data from multiple sources. This would include UAS. Um, so we do offer a, a full line or a full uh, fully featured um, GIS services and consulting. Uh, we do have some upcoming vector control webinars. If you found today's useful and interesting, we do have some more scheduled here over the next six weeks or so, actually about two months. Um, by following this link, you can register for any of our upcoming webinars. You can also view recorded webinars from our, pre uh, our webinars that we've already completed by following this link. With that, we've reached the end of our presentation. I would like to take some time to answer some questions at this point. Um, let's see if some questions have come in. Let me get this opened up better. Um, one question, very good question. How soon do you see using this with a payload such as for larva siding operations? Um, Right now, we're, we're looking at payloads that include data acquisition tools, which is the imaging. Um, but the advancements in the technology may allow us to actually deliver product from these from these uh, UAS devices. As far as a timeline, there's some work that has to be done with the FAA to get it licensed properly. And I'm not sure how long that um, how long that took or how long that will take. Um, there's some pretty interesting options there. I know that. Um, uh, there's a couple companies out there developing uh, technology to do this, but uh, um, there's some FAA hoops that have to be jumped through before it would be a viable technology. Uh, Chase, that second question is, what height were you flying to get the images? So on that uh, demo data set I, I showed um, of the landfill, we were flying at about uh, 75 meters, which is about 240, 250 feet, 
above the ground. That's kind of the optimum height for the UX5 system, and, and different systems will fly at different elevations, but that's the optimal height based on the camera specs and calibration and the speed that it flies at and all that to get acquire good high-resolution imagery for, you know, a two-centimeter ground sampling distance. Um, we don't operate more than 400 feet above the ground. The, the Trimble system can operate, it can actually fly up to 750 meters or about 2,300 feet, um, but the FAA won't allow it. So any operations we're going to do are going to be, for the time being, between usually about 250 and 400 feet above the ground. This, uh, this next question may be one that you can answer too, Chase. What laws would stop a mosquito vector control district from flying over a house or private property? That's a that's a good question, and and the the ball's still kind of in the air on that. I guess, as to my knowledge, the the FAA is not so much concerned with privacy. They they're not a regulating agency over privacy laws. They only care about airspace and safety. The issue is. Uh, and so they have restrictions on how far they want you flying UAS to, or how close they want you flying any aircraft to buildings or homes or anything. And it's typically 500 feet, which can be cumbersome for flying uh, uh, over a house because if you can only fly 400 feet above the ground, um, but the FAA wants you to be at least 500 feet from a building, that pretty much rules out flying directly over them. So you might have to capture oblique imagery with a multi-rotor or something like that. But, but. Um, that's that's only one piece, and that was probably more surmountable as time moves forward and the FAA allows us to get permits or exemptions to fly at different altitudes. Um, but the the maybe the more concerning thing for privacy would, would come from a local or a state ordinance or law. The the, the FAA doesn't, doesn't care um, about whether we're taking photos or whether we're dropping um, you know packages at people's front doors. All they care about is airspace safety. But the local government in some states have already passed laws that restrict, you know, use of drones over over uh, buildings or residences based on privacy and what you're doing or what the payload is. If there's a camera on there, you could be in violation of something. So you'd probably need to just consult with your local authorities and local uh, laws to, to confirm that you're in compliance there. Um, but also a lot of exceptions for um, public use and you know, Google doesn't have to go out and get rent permission from every house and they're taking satellite photos of us every day or Google Street View. So there's a lot of stuff that is public domain and isn't so sensitive, but, but it would be wise to just check with your local authorities and laws to make sure you're in compliance. All right. Well, thank you, Chase. Um, that does, uh, we reached the time limit on today's presentation. We appreciate your participation today. As I mentioned, this webinar has been recorded. You can review it again at any time here in the future. It'll be online later today. Um, I will be following up with each of you who have attended uh, just to see what questions you might have. We'll follow up and, and uh, work with you from there. We appreciate your time. Have a good day.